we'll keep on looking at what we were looking at, which was antiderivative. Um, let's look at a few examples. For now, we're going to be pretty limited in the examples we can look at because we're pretty limited in the antiderivatives we can take. So most real world functions are a little more complicated than anything we can deal with right now. And sort of the classic example to get our feet wet with antiderivatives is position, velocity, acceleration. I've gone on record as saying that I that I think these examples are a little a little banal, but they do provide this very nice flow chart where you can go from position to velocity or from velocity to acceleration, taking the derivative. And therefore, you can go from acceleration to velocity or from velocity to position by taking the antiderivative. And the really nice thing from a pedagogical viewpoint is that acceleration under Earth's gravity is very simple. It's a constant, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, which I believe is negative 32 feet per second squared. So because it's such a simple function, we can actually take the antiderivatives and we can actually do the exam. So putting aside the question of how interesting it is, at least it's accessible. What does... What does it tell us that acceleration is negative 9.8? What can we get using that information and only that information? Well, velocity is an antiderivative of the acceleration. So it's negative 9.8 T, but then we have a constant of integration. So to find the velocity function, it's not enough to just know the acceleration. We need some other piece of information, which makes sense, right? I mean, if I throw this object up, Words, or I throw this object downward, its acceleration is the same, but obviously its velocity isn't. So if you know acceleration, you can get information, but imperfect information about the velocity. What about the position function? Remember, S for strict for position. I am definitely mispronouncing that, but position is an antiderivative of the velocity. Now, this velocity function is a power function. It's not written that way, but having T means that we have T to the first. So, 
At this point, I'm going to start, I hope not going too fast, but going a little faster than I was going yesterday. That negative 9.8 is a constant. When you take an integral, constants just sit there. So negative 9.8 sits there. This power is bumped up. The one becomes a two. And we also, and that's, uh, that's put multiplication symbols here so that it doesn't look like 9.8 and a half. So this is negative 9.8 times a half times T squared. The antiderivative of C or N antiderivative of C is C times T. And now we have a new constant of integration from taking this second antiderivative. So that works out to negative 4.9 T squared plus C T plus D. How can we use this form to the, or what do these form to those tell us? Let's some um, copy some stuff to the next frame. Let's copy A. Let's copy V. And let's copy S. So we have these constants of integration. We have this C and we have this D. And let's ask ourselves what these constants of integration tell us. I mean, presumably they have some kind of concrete real world meaning. Because this problem has a concrete real world meaning. We're looking at real expressions here. Well, if you take differential equations, probably most of you won't need it, but I'd be happy to have all of you. Um, you see this idea of an initial condition a lot. Um, if we let t be a zero, what is a function doing? And the answer in this case is that if we let t be a zero, the function is equal to c. Because if t is zero, negative 9.8, times zero goes away, and we're just left with the C. So this C is our initial velocity. Whatever process we're looking at, the velocity is changing as time passes. And at the start of the process, at t equals zero, this velocity is this constant of integration. And very similar down here, if you let t be zero, Everything that's being multiplied by T is multiplied by zero. It goes away. And we're left with S of zero equals D. So, oops, well, S of zero equals D. So this D, 
is the initial position. And I mean, you might have had to memorize this at some point, like in high school, maybe, or I don't know, even Shadron's physics course. You might have just been given this in, um, equation. And then because you didn't have any help to this background, you maybe weren't really given any indication of where it comes from. It comes from starting with a constant acceleration and taking some antiderivatives. Let's take all of this information and do a, an example. Does anybody have any questions before we go onwards? Let me, I'm going to want this calculator. Let me get it up and running. So this example is basically from your textbook. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers the word that um, the textbook used, but it's something like a hot air balloon. Our textbook author loves hot air balloons. It's a strange thing, but they appear in at least two examples in the textbook. I just because I suppose just because it's a very easy example of something rising straight upwards. But a hot air balloon is going straight up. It is 30 meters above the ground. Rising. Ooh, some Zoom is doing this thing where suddenly there's this long delay between my writing and the words appearing. Hope that isn't too distracting. So it's 30 meters above the ground going upwards at a rate of 10 meters per second when when an object, it's distracting me, I hope it's not distracting you, when an object is dropped. From the balloon. How quickly will the object be falling? When it hits the ground. And in all of these problems, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to memorize this, I guess. I can give it to you when you need it but we'll just treat the acceleration as being known because acceleration under Earth's gravity is fixed. I mean, there are 
okay, moving away from the mathematics and into the science. There are assumptions we're making here, in particular, the idea that the acceleration is constant is ignoring wind resistance, so it's not a totally realistic situation. But for our purposes, we're looking for a kind of easy function to work with as we cautiously move into antiderivatives, we'll treat acceleration as being constant. So what are we looking for here? I mean, before we just blunder in and start doing calculus stuff, taking derivatives or taking antiderivatives. Let's pause and ask, what do we have? What do we want? Well, we have a velocity. We also have a height. We want, and we have, although it might not, it's not stated explicitly in this problem, we have an acceleration as well. What we want is a velocity, right? We want to know how quickly the object is falling when something happens. But we're also being asked something about the height, right? Because the object hits the ground when the height is zero. So we're asking what happens when the height is zero. To answer this question, we're probably going to have to figure out Okay, well, when is the height to zero? So we're probably going to need both the velocity function and the height function, the position function. Now, I wouldn't uh, commit this stuff to memory necessarily. I would just try to get in a position where I can take these antiderivatives quickly. Starting with the fact that we know the acceleration. Let's look for the velocity. And the velocity is the antiderivative of the acceleration. I keep saying the, it would be more appropriate to say that the velocity is n antiderivative of the acceleration. That acceleration function has an infinite class of antiderivatives. And let's see if we can work this C out. We've already talked about C as an initial condition. B of zero equals C. <laughs> This problem isn't give, explicitly giving us a time frame. Like, what is it here? The, uh, the problem isn't telling us, but we're given information about what happens at the moment the object is released. So, and that's what we're interested in. We're interested in what happens from the moment the object is released to the moment the object hits the ground. So T equals zero should probably be the moment the object is released.
So going back to this problem, if I'm in this hot air balloon, I'm holding something over the side, I'm going up, the balloon is going up 10 meters per second, I'm going up 10 meters per second, the object I'm holding over the side is going up at 10 meters per second. So at the start of all of this, the object is rising and it will continue to rise for a while after I release it. So its initial velocity is that 10 meters per second. So here's our velocity function, and we can now answer questions about how quickly the object is falling. If the question were just how quickly is the object falling after one second, for example, we'd be done. We could just plug t equals one in there, and we wouldn't need to take any other antiderivatives. The trick with this problem, as it were, is that, again, we're asked what happens when the object hits the ground, and we don't know when that is. So we don't know what value of t needs to be plugged into this velocity function. To find when the object hits the ground, that's the same as asking when its height is zero. So we need more information. We need the height function so that we can set height equal to zero and find when the object hits the ground. Height is an antiderivative of velocity. Uh, we've already done this, but new sort of new material, so let's do it again. This constant just sits there when we take an antiderivative. Having t is the same as having t to the first. So we hit this function with the power rule, the power goes up by one, but we also divide by the new power. The antiderivative of 10 is 10 times t, and we get a constant of integration. And just mess, uh, erasing and messing around here, negative 9.8 times one half is negative Again, we have this constant of integration. And again, we've sort of already discussed what this constant of integration is doing. When you let t be zero, negative 4.9 times zero squared is zero and 10 times zero is zero. So D is giving you the height at time zero. It's giving you the initial height.
Well, the initial height, we were 30 meters off when this object was dropped. So this D is 30. And what we said, we want to know when this object hits the ground. Well, this object hits the ground when its height above the ground is zero. So now we have this negative 4.9 T squared plus 10 T plus 30 equals zero. And I don't, I mean, if you more of you were math majors, I'd say you really should memorize the quadratic form of a, since you're not, I'm not sure I'd honestly call this a priority. Maybe, maybe we'll take the lazy way out. And take a look at this graphically. So we're looking at y equals negative 4.9 t squared and some other stuff plus 10 t plus 30. And we're interested in when this object hits the ground, when its height is zero. Well, there are two places where the height is zero, but only one of them makes any sense. I mean, time is the number of seconds after we drop the object. It's certainly not hitting the ground, negative 1.656 seconds after it hits the ground. So 3.697 is the only solution that makes any sense. And now we can answer the question that was actually asked of us. We wanted to know the velocity when the object hits the ground. Well, we now know that the object hits the ground after 3.697 seconds. So we'll just take that value of T and plug it in. Is our calculator up? It is. Negative 9.8 times 3.697 plus 10. The object hits the ground with a velocity of negative 26.2306 um, meters per second. Negative 
two, three, one. Let's say. And there's an example, a word problem, albeit obviously a somewhat artificial word problem. And if you haven't attempted the quiz yet, um, the problems on the quiz mostly look like this or something like this. They're less uh, complicated than this, but let's just do a second example. No word problem here, but let's say that F prime of X equals X squared minus one fifth x cubed plus the cosine of x. And let's say we have information about f of zero. f of zero equals one. And I don't know, again, probably most of you won't take differential equations with me. We might have time to touch on this in calculus too, but this is a very common situation in applied problems. You know something's current value and you know how fast it's changing. And you want to know what happens in the future. You know what the object is now. You know how fast it's changing. You want to know what the value will be in the future. And I mean, I say we'll talk about this maybe in calculus too, but it's not hard to come up with clear examples of this. I mean, um, this, I guess this is just becoming my permanent go-to example now, um, because, but during the COVID epidemic, I mean, what were mathematicians and hospital technicians and everybody trying to do while well, they were asking, okay, we have this many people in the hospital now, this is how fast the infection rate seems to be. Are we going to have enough beds tomorrow? I mean, they were trying to use a rate of change and a current value to predict a future value. So to do an example like this, well, if we want F at some value, we'd better find F of X. And finding F of X, is a matter of taking an antiderivative. You know the derivative, you want the original function. So we've got two power functions here. Um, We've got two power functions here. And the rule for anti-differentiating a power function is to bump the power up by one and then divide by it. And the rule for dealing with constants is just to leave them in. 
So we'll have that negative one fifth. And then as for the third power, we'll bump it up to four and then divide by four. That the derivative of the sine is the cosine and the antiderivative of the cosine is therefore the sine is something you should know. It should just be in your memory, in your mathematician's cool box, as it were. And then we have a constant of integration. And I'll just do the very natural simplification here. One fifth times one fourth is one twentieth. Now to find f of 0 0.05, we need to know what c is. And there's this piece of information we haven't used yet, that f of 0 equals 1. f of 0 equals and now we just um one. And now we just plug zero in to f of x and see what happens. Um, in this particular case, it ends up being very straightforward. One third zero cubed is zero. One twentieth zero to the fourth, zero. The sine of zero also ends up being zero. So we just start that with C. Um, I mean, that it, the constant of integration isn't always going to be x f of zero. I know we've done three examples in a row where that ended up happening. But if, I mean, if instead of the sine, we'd have, we had the cosine here, then f of zero would be one plus c. So it's, it's a coincidence that, that we keep ending up with f of zero just being the constant of integration. <clears throat> But it's what happened here. And now that we know what f of x is, finding f of um f of zero point to zero five. is just plugging in to a calculator. Let's see, we had one third times point zero five cubed minus one twenty s obviously this is much faster by hand when you're not constantly switching between screens to the if I remember correctly. Yes, plus the sine of 0 
plus one. So our prediction for what happens at x equals 0 0.05 is that y is this 1.05002. And I think at this point, all that's left for antiderivatives is for students to practice them. So I'll have to look at what I want to do tomorrow. Um, I don't have another section open for this week. Maybe we'll start next week's material a little early, maybe just in class review. I'll work that out on my own. But at any rate, you should be attempting this quiz if you haven't already. And I will see you tomorrow and you'll get your take home test tomorrow as well.